Go ahead. Okay. So, okay, I did my um, presentation over generative design in Revit, and I said it's the future of AEC. So what is generative design? Generative design is the data-driven algorithm-based process of solving complex design problems by inputting variables, parameters, and factors, and generating iterations of the most optimized designs that fit those needs. Um, below, I have like two pictures that are examples of generative design used in the AEC industry um, in practice. This is a Hadar Aliyev Center created by Zaha Hadid Architects, um, completed in 2012 in um, Azerbaijan. I'm not very good at pronouncing some of their names, but and then uh, the second one is Steampunk Pavilion. This was created by um, a group of architects in 2019 in Estonia. Some examples um, that generative design can be used for besides like uh, making like building forms or structure forms would be um, optimizing parking lots, um, the spaces inside, like maximizing how many you can have, um, stadium seating, getting like all the different bleachers, um, different kinds of heights and stuff so that everyone can like see COVID-19 seating in restaurants ever since uh, social distancing has been a policy, like arranging their seating so that there's a lot of seating in there still with the six feet apart rule. Uh, medical facilities, the rooms, um, and fastest paths from point A to point B for workers, uh, maximizing window lighting inside of buildings and ma manufacturing products. So a brief history of generative design. Um, there's no like, set date or person to elude the invention of generative design, but it started around the 1970s. Um, that's at least when the architecture industry began to really explore it. Um, this floor um, pattern here that I have here was actually one of the first generative designs implemented into a project, and it is the Palladium um, Villas made in 1978. Um, by an architect. And then in the 1990s, architects and engineers began to really look into it more as like technology and like programming languages became more advanced so that they could do more of this sort of stuff. And then today, um, the AI is really capable of like creating numerous um, iterations and even analyzing them for the user so that they can choose the best one for their needs. Um, so the benefits are that like it may take a person or a group of people um, a full day, you know, a long time to create a few drawings. But with generative design, it is basically all done with um, one person using a computer and they can create like, you know, up to hundreds or whatever designs in just a few minutes. So the benefits are that it's fast and efficient and it can really help everyone see all the different permutations that can come from um, their selected inputs and they're all optimized for what they want. Um, there are a few downsides. Some downsides are that um, because like the computer can do so much more than people can in a way, um, it can like take out like some of the jobs of those people. So there is like some positions at risk for it. And it also um, tends to like, like people have high expectations of generative design. So sometimes they may just like, you know, run their outputs through a computer, not maybe like think too, too much about other ideas that could be very creative and useful as well. Kind of like the human create creative side of things instead of just the AI. Um, this is generative design workflow. The steps, um, basically there's generate. This is where, um, this is a stage when design options are created or generated by the system using algorithms and parameters specified by the designer. Analyze is the designs generated in the previous step. Um, they're now measured and analyzed on how well they achieve the goals defined by the designer. And then um, the rank is based on the results of the analysis. Design options are ordered or ranked. 
Evolve is the process uses the ranking of the design options to figure out in which direction design should be further developed or evolved. Explore is the designer compares and explores the generated designs inspecting the results based on their original criteria. And Integrate is after choosing a favorite design option, the designer uses or integrates this, this design into a wider project or design work. And then this is kind of like um, the workflow in Revit using the Revit generative design tool. Um, essentially, you set up what kind of inputs and variables and constraints and goals and everything you want into their box. They kind of have it all listed for you and you once you have all of what you need for your project put in, it goes through Revit's functions, which is a series of scripts that run the inputs through the designated visual code. Then visualization, this is where it actually creates the graphics from what it found. And then evaluators is the data and information given about the designs generated in relation to the preset goals. And generative design is when it outputs everything that you, um, want I guess and then um, as you refine and refine your process it um, creates an algorithm so that it speeds it up even more and then you just keep following the loop until you eventually get what you want. So these are a few companies that have used generative design for some of their buildings. Um, this is Zaha Hadid Architects um, building again from the first slide. Um, and then this is Autodesk, of course, making their own generative design building. It's um, their Toronto office. It's pretty interesting because it's the first generative designed office space of that scale because it's 60,000 square feet um, over three floors. Another interesting thing is 250 employees gave their office preferences and 10,000 solutions were produced. Um, and then this one is the Daiwa House Group and they create a lot of different urban houses. About 91% of people in Japan live in cities and they're constantly trying to come up with like new like floor plans and materials and things to make their houses and then this one is uh, located in the Netherlands, Stam Hoist. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, but they basically um, have variety of stores, um, basic um, supermarket chains, and like small, like boutiques and stuff like that. Um, and they focus in generative design mainly in their interior, like getting all the layout. Um, optimized for their merchandise and whatnot. And then the last one is AROB and it's the Metropole Parcels. Um, this is, this is, um, yeah, okay. This is also a uh, timber structure. So like all of the um, parts of it make it timber and it's one of the largest timber structures in the world. Okay, so um, using generative design in Revit. So it's a new feature that was added in the AEC collection in Revit 2021. Um, Revit 2022 is now out and it also includes it, but essentially it looks at, um, it's not as comprehensive probably as other generative design programs out there, but it still can do the job for um, quickly figuring out some room layouts or massing and um, kind of window views that you want. But they go over a few goals like low distraction, adjacency preference, interconnectivity, daylight used outside and work style. Um, all for, for example, a, works, a workspace space and so yeah, let's see. This is then my tutorial, um, getting right into it. Um, there are three different things, studies that generative design goes over in Revit. There's maximizing window views, three box massing and workspace layout. Um, going over workspace layout, you basically have to create a room first. Make sure you have like a door. You can also add some windows um, and then at least one furniture element inside because once you start the study, um, you won't be able to go back and like change your room at all. And so once you start the study, uh, this window will pop up and um, there will be several links where you will have to select the specific elements in your model so yeah, that um, it works. Okay. 
And then basically you can choose your variables, goals, constraints. Um, we can see that it gets like a little detailed, but also like it's not completely complex. And then you can hit generate and it goes. Um, so this is just an example of the room I had created for it. And then some of the outputs that the generative design program found. Um, same thing with maximizing windows, essentially. Um, I have like this room that I created. There's obstructions, windows, a chair, and it shows you after you input all your stuff, um, what kind of views from the outside you get from like the chair. And then for the three box massing, you don't need a model. You can just create the study right away and it starts going over all of the different um, like iterations that it produced from what you wanted in your inputs and these little graphs on the bottom you can actually like change to sh show you um, specific outputs that you want but yeah th these are my YouTube links and that's basically it. Thank you. I assume you record your process in a longer YouTube video. Yeah TV. it's a lot longer. <laughs> Good all right thank you. Uh, well uh, as usual we're going to hold all the questions at the end. Um, I also actually find out we don't have 10 minutes per person. We have roughly about eight minutes per person. So once you reach to the eight minutes, I will just you know raise up this note saying one. That means one minute left. Okay, so just a reminder, eight minutes. Uh, all right, so we move on to Kirsten as the next one. Hi, um, actually, so mine was very similar. Um, let me pull this up to Anna's. Um, I'm also talking about generative design, so I can hopefully get through it a little quick. I'll try not to right. overlap on the same things she talked about. Um, for mine, I was kind of more focusing on like a discussion of how using um, generative design in um, the Revit page versus using the Dynamo plugin. Um, here, wait. Let me make this here. Okay. Um, so, also talking about generative design and how it just creates an optimal de design from a set of systems requirements and it just produces a, many outcomes as told, and you can kind of like pick through them. Um, you kind of, we went from like traditional design, which was more like sketching and documentation without like using computer aid and then parametric design where we kind of set more parameters and kind of were like figuring out design between limits and generative design is more like overall like figuring out a bunch of outcomes within um, more limits and kind of being able to like flip through it a lot easier. Um, it, it in time um, it definitely takes a lot of less time to use than um, the other ones, but um, it seems like we can only see our first page, the PDF cover page. Oh, sorry. So they are sharing. Um, let me try that again. Sure. Uh, you can really share your screen. Oh yeah, share screen. Okay. This there we go. Yeah, that's good. Oh. Yeah, and then, okay, so I will kind of try to keep more a little off of or a little farther from what Anna was showing just so it's not too repetitive. Um, I was kind of talking about using it directly in Revit and like the construction analysis side to it and how to be able to use it to produce construction, construction documents and work like a day to day um, life in an average office, I guess. Um, so, um, yeah, it's using generative design started like kind of in 2020, but it wasn't really introduced until 2021. Um, and you can use it kind of in two formats of it being the direct plugin of to Revit or using it through Dynamo, and they're quite similar of a process using um, them. It's just, I would say, like D Dynamo is 
more similar to Grasshopper in which you're like moving things around in scripts, um, but it is simplified to like actually programming it in code um, like it was used to used. Um, and um, the downside is that this, like uh, Anna kind of showed the first three that are given in Revit, but obviously those are pretty simple and they are trying to use it for a lot more complex issues. And so the downside is that the script does take a while to build and definitely needs to have someone with some intelligence of how to use or create scripts. Um, they were saying typically and like some examples of when they were used it, that the scripts take a few weeks, but then after you making the scripts, um, you can plug any project into it. Um, and then some ways that they can use it are like the parking lot layout, stadium seating, window punch, skin studies, hospital floor layouts. Um, so an example that I saw that they used Dynamo, um, to create a quicker um, study was AB Klassen in Denmark. They were trying to transfer the like hole punches from the architecture model in Revit into the structure model. And so they were able to um, create this code where it, um, I don't know if I can play this, um, kind of just like punched each of um, the windows exactly where the windows were showing in the other model. And then another way, oh, a way it could be used in other fields than just like architecture is, I actually feel like it might be more commonly used in like structural or environmental um, fields because um, it can do a lot of different studies about um, lighting and sh strength. And like in this um, example, it is like thinking through how, where a crank should be positioned to bring all the heavy materials in and how it needs to move through the site, which I was thought was interesting. Um, and so, a quick walkthrough of the workflow of how it was used is, as Anna said, the generative design is right here and then Dynamo. So it, it's both on the managed page, so it's easy to kind of work through both. It comes with these six options. Um, and so when you download Revit, it, the generative design comes with it and it also gives you these six options as dyna Dynamo. Um, files so you can use them both within the Revit or just using it through Dynamo. And so these are like the files you should to use it in Dynamo. You just open Dynamo up and then you open the files, which is the exact same as just using it in Revit. Um, it's just I get Revit has an easier like toggle um, menu to use than Dynamo. You have to kind of go back and forth between the uh, script in Dynamo um, and kind of have a better understanding of using Grasshopper or something similar to Dynamo. Um, and for minute. okay, and then for my project, I wanted to show something that we could or most students could easily use for um, studio production. And so I. My video is showing how you can use Dynamaps to get kind of information from all over um, the world to create a site plan and in Revit and then kind of like change the materials and stuff. So that is just by downloading Dynamaps and then um, writing your own script to create uh, forms to relate back to Revit. Um, and then I guess this was like a confusing part, but to make the Revit buildings and you can like change them. That's pretty much it. All right, good. I look forward to watch the full video. I think the okay. Dynamite looks pretty cool.
Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Ming. Yep. Thank you. All right. Um, let's move on to the next person. All right, I can see you, Josh. Mm -hmm. uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Great. All right, so I'm going to be presenting about kinetic architecture and uh, visualizing that through uh, using Maya software. Um, and I'm just going to walk through what kinetic architecture is, and then I'm going to do some uh, case studies using the software and just studying how um, how kinetic architecture can be applied to different uh, situations. So what is ar uh, kinetic architecture? So it's architecture that moves, and this is not official definition. This is kind of my own definition. So. Um, I think a lot of things can be kinetic architecture. Um, it's kind of a blending between machine and architecture, in my opinion. And it occurs both within the architectural systems. Um, like uh, you'll commonly see like shading devices being used in this way where shading devices will adapt to the environment. Um, so that's a system within the building that will be moving, um, and but the building as a whole could also move. So there's a wide range, like the smallest things that's moving to the biggest thing that's moving that could be kinetic uh, or considered kinetic. Uh, so this creates a smart building and it adapts to its environment. So some examples of a kinetic architecture and what's out there. Uh, this is the sliding house. This entire roof uh, covers this house and moves on a track. Uh, and you can see like the inside's glass and the different situations you might want that roof there or not. Um, and this is in Milwaukee. It's the Milwaukee Art Museum. Uh, and this uh, wing-like structure shades and unfolds uh, throughout the day. And that'll be something I'll look into um, in some of my case studies. And then uh, this is the Albar Towers, uh, and they're using uh, origami to help facilitate sun shading across the building facade. So looking at some, oh, and then using Maya to help visualize kinetic architecture, Ming has a great library of where to start if you've never used Maya, and I definitely needed to go through these tutorials myself. Um, and I, I'm some of them are going to some of my case studies going to follow closely with those tutorials, but uh, providing context. And then I have one at the end that I think is more exploratory and more exciting um, that kind of branches off from that. Um, and so what you need to know is you need to understand the bone and skeleton structures within Maya, and then how, how to blend shapes within Maya, and that will be something that will be covered within my video. So I'm going to look at the Farnsworth House and maybe potentially disaster prevention. When I was at the Farnsworth House, they mentioned that the site floods, um, and, and the potential solution to that might be to like raise the building up so that when um, the site floods, it, the building can be safe and they want to do a bunch of repairs every, they said every 50 years. Um, and and the, currently the building's uh, under repair, but this is something that could be a solution long term. Uh, so, and this this is a visualization of maybe how like the pistons could work and the foundation, and that would be considered uh, kinetic. The building's moving up, oh, that's a building's moving up. Uh, and down according to the environment. Uh, so the next case study would be just DAP. Um, uh, the 7000 Studio <laughs> gets really hot and could use a shading device of some sort. So I'm going to take a look at the shading devices on Milwaukee. This is <laughs> somewhat of an extreme case. 
and definitely an interesting look to the side of the building, but it could be applied anywhere. And so, uh, and this device, uh, these appendages would uh, move and adapt to where the sun might be, and there's like some kind of fabric that would uh, block the sun and help shade those studios throughout the day. And then I was looking at a lot of uh, precedents, and this one really popped, uh, stuck, stuck out to me. There's like this uh, acoustical paneling that adapts to the environment. So maybe there's too much noise in a large space or even in a concert hall that the acoustic paneling could adapt to um, based on like the sound levels to optimize it. So this was a study on like, uh, how origami could be used in tandem with kinetic architecture and just a visualization of that using Maya um, and it, it scratches really far down but that's like maybe an extreme case of what could be uh, shown um, in, a, in a very large space or even an auditorium space. So and then in conclusion there's this so many different types of kinetic architecture to explore and there's many more to explore than I just mentioned. There's like I showed a case of sun shading, but there's uh, many other uses you could like develop a uh, wall texture or um, I've seen like kinetic sculptures where they're using like mechanical means to like move on their own uh, or architecture that heals, musical. Um, I've seen waterfalls of like uh, the water creates sound um, throughout the building and moving parts of the building, like being able to uh, actively change the spatial environment has been, is another um, big part of Connect architecture. So, and that's my presentation. All right. Thank you. Oh, well, I think this is a very uh, exciting um, way or method to explore the you know the, the design uh, of forms uh, using the this kind of like a four dimension way right not, not three dimension plus time um, four dimension way to to generate some interesting form it could be kinetic it could be you know burn shape or origami origami is relatively difficult to do uh, in, in maya but for the bone structure is perfect if you want to animate the shading device so i'm glad to see that Cool. All right, uh, let's move on to next person. I think that's me. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. OK, let me switch over. Can you see that? Yes. Yep. OK, so I did a pufferfish plugin demo for Grasshopper and Rhino. I give a nice thorough introduction of that. And pufferfish is really great at patterns and transformation and manipulations of origin points and stretching them along different lines and surfaces. So it's a versatile tool that changes the shape and orientation. It uses tweens, blends, morphs, and averages to transform curves, surfaces, and meshes. It works best with incremental transitions between two or more objects. And I covered a lot of tools in this demo, a lot of the different tween tools, specifically how the difference between, between two surfaces, between consecutive surfaces, and between through surfaces, all change different arrangements of space and how you can tweak these to your preferences. Uh, I also go over displacing and offsetting meshes and how to deal with uh, transforming colors between two shapes and a couple of the other functions that are very specific to pufferfish. But in doing my research, I also discovered a lot of basics in grasshoppers. They're very useful for anyone that is interested in using grasshopper as a generative tool. The graph mapper in particular is very useful in transforming um, an initial starting space and letting objects move differently throughout. 
the Boolean toggle is really good for a lot of functions that require on off switches. Bounding box and box morphs go well together. And the swatch command is actually really great at coloring things. So you're not just locked into your red and green variants that pop up in Grasshopper. Also, a couple of uh, the unique tools I found in Rhino, uh, you really want to use the soft edit surface. That's a function that I was very interested in 3DS Max, and I didn't realize that Rhino had that as well. So you can control the UV values for surfaces to really get a more flexible surface. So you don't have to necessarily create those through a curve. And this is useful because there's a very big difference between trim surfaces and untrimmed surfaces when it comes to grasshopper, specifically pufferfish. So if you're finding you're not getting the results you're looking for, try creating a general surface first and then doing the soft edit to be able to transform that to what your needs are. Also, the surface to mesh is extremely important do, using some of the mesh tools and a couple other things as well. So with pufferfish, you have a really great ability to find the shapes in between other shapes. So on this example on the left, you can see I started with a bird, a fish, a circle, and a square, and it found all the um, objects in between those shapes. So you can create a whole grid of different patterns, and this is a great way to generate design choices if you're trying to find a specific uh, form that's in between two extremes. And then also, if you do a function like this along a curve, you can create a transformation along a surface and really get some interesting results if you're doing entire city blocks. I go over tween through surfaces and tween surfaces along curves too. So not only can you change the way that you're growing surfaces through a line, but you can change that line in different orientations and be able to apply different filters to that, like extrudes and lofts to create your poly surfaces. So these uh, formulas can get quite complex, but it's really just duplicating things. So this form on the left is really just two basic geometries and two um, curves. And by implementing all of these different uh, algorithms to it, you can create complex shapes relatively easily as long as you kind of understand the nature of the tweening tools and the twisted box tools, which are two of the most predominant functions of pufferfish. And then you can create more complex, more complexity by aligning or assigning floor plans to basic building shapes and even um, implementing structure within that to figure out what your grid structure could be, even if that's morphing throughout your building. And by duplicating that, you can create both shell structures and internal form structures as well using this twisted box morph. And then when it comes to meshes, you have an even wider range of tools available to you. You can see that by using this graph mapper, which is down here in the center, you can change the arrangement of your iterations to kind of jump between one end of your series to another end of your series. And again, with this Boolean toggle, you could loop back and create a closed loop and really play between what objects are blending into which. Lastly, I want to talk about um, how you could displace this mesh. This is another useful tool in Pufferfish, which lets you break apart your meshes and extrude them to a certain amount and then go ahead and re- We'll turn those, turn those planes back into poly surfaces again, which act as meshes. So you can create a whole series of, of shapes that are exploding and transforming and changing shape throughout a series of initial starting points. Lastly, I want to talk about tween two colors. And this is uh, a component that's found in the initial folder for Grasshopper or for Pufferfish when you download it. And basically, you can use an attractor point to blend two colors together and have those colors be connected to a point of gravity. So you can see this pink ball there is pulling that yellow color towards it, while the rest of the shape is colored by the pink. So again, very useful to um, change the design that you're aiming to make. 
So in general, I give a half hour lecture on several of these tools, creating a dozen different scripts that I've included in the project folder that you can play around with and decide what your design choices could generate from there. And I think it's very useful to sort through the workflow folder. So I've highlighted a couple of these very basic ones that go over the graph mapper, or the tweening color, or curves or services. Uh, a lot of these require another plugin called an enemy, anemone or weaver bird, which I've yet to do, but I believe that it can create some very useful combinations as well. I think a lot of these scripts are very easy to work with once you start to analyze them, but a lot of them are very complicated and require many different levels of input. So, and you do need a pretty powerful machine to be able to do it because there's so many variables that are going on here. Just for instance, if you think about the first series of patterns I showed you with the birds and the fish, this is a component that he has in the workflow folder. It's a very complex script with many different attributes of growing the grid, changing the grid, using attractor points and implementing geometries within a box morph to be able to curve and transform these shapes from one to another. So a very complicated tool that definitely takes some more analysis to figure out. And lastly, I just want to include a link to the plugin in general, a link to my video, and then three other videos that really show some of these introductory uh, techniques in Pufferfish. There's really not too many videos out there about Pufferfish, so I think my introductory video is a great way to get started in understanding tweens and different blends between shapes. Thank you, Brian. Well, this is real, really con well controlled timing. <laughs> uh, you got precisely eight minutes. Uh, that's great. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Good work. I look forward to read uh, to watch the full video. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so let's move on to next person. Who is after Jeffrey? Um, well, if Jeffrey is not here, I guess we can move on to Josh. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. Let me share my screen. Okay. All right. So, um, my research topic was digital fabrication and, um, it's like application and architecture. Um, so I kind of broke it down into two different parts, which is like the research topic, which I went into specifically digital fabrication um, and how it's like being used in architecture today. And then I kind of did a Rhino and IV demonstration unrolling, taking this concept of like origami paper folding and unrolling and using the IV plugin to um, unroll a mesh. So going into the research, um, I kind of digital fabrication is a process, a design and manufacturing process that uses uh, CAD software and CAM software. So computer aided design and computer aided manufacturing to control equipment to produce different geometries. Um, in digital fabrication, there are three main methods. So you can have additive manufacturing, which encompasses like 3D printing, subtractive manufacturing which is like laser cutting and cnc milling and then robotic manipulation which is using robots to perform repetitive tasks like folding bending or weaving um, how it's applied into architecture is through five main areas which is construction or construction automation new material development new aesthetic development formal element advancement and open source design um, in the construction process, there are a lot of different factors that restrict the efficiency of the construction process. So um, using robots and AI to perform repetitive tasks like bricklaying and um, component assembly can allow humans to be more efficient in different areas of the construction process and overall speed up and make the entire process more efficient. Um, a lot of present day materials are produce a high carbon footprint and a lot of waste. 
So using digital fabrication can allow us to create new materials that produce that are like more natural elements that produce a lot less waste or virtually no waste. Um, when it comes to aesthetic, similarly materials and costs limit like the geometries we can use in the facades and aesthetics of different structures. So um, when it comes to digital fabrication and you're doing additive and subtractive manufacturing methods, you can piece together and create much more complex geometries with different surfaces and ornaments. For formal elements, um, using 3D printing, you can now create either conventional architectural forms like slabs and even add an unconventional twist to them like this image on the right here and even design them to respond like respond and handle different loads and use the minimal material um, necessary to handle those loads. And then open source design is something that's new in architecture, but starting to be applied, which is takes the concept of open source software and which is where a software like copyright holder allows a user to change and distribute software. So it's this idea that a designer allows like a homeowner or someone he's designing for like a client to change his like the design in a way that they see fit it could be post design or post construction. So um, digital fabrication allows for a new area for this to open up an architecture where after the fact you can produce use digital fabrication to produce replaceable materials in the design so they can be changed and manipulated as like a client sees fit. And then moving into my demonstration, um, a big influence on digital fabrication is this idea of moving from 3D to 2D back to 3D in the real world. So something that it draws heavily on is the art of origami. So taking 2D elements and, like pieces and shaping them together into complex geometric three-dimensional forms. Um, so that leads me into my demonstration where um, I just got the the uh, Ivy plugin from Food for Rhino and then actually what comes with it, which was really helpful, was this example set um, where they have the like developer for the plugin like um, has a bunch of different examples and tutorials and he kind of uses different pieces of script that he used from different plugins and that are like from older versions of Revit that you can you use in your own script too as well. So I found that downloading this example set helped me understand um, Ivy a lot more. So the first step was just create this mesh. So in Ivy or in Rhino, I just created like this 3D chess piece and I wanted it to be, since it was a demonstration, not super, super complex. So I reduced the mesh count quite a bit from what it originally was just so I, you could visualize the pieces more and there weren't just a bunch spread out and it was hard to understand. But you could theoretically like it would take longer, but you didn't have to reduce your mesh as much with this process. It'll um, it can take in whatever mesh you assign to it. And then I assigned it and in Grasshopper script. So this is my script, which in my video tutorial, I go in depth each piece of the script. Um, and I can just talk briefly about how this first part is just like assigning the mesh and then um, creating like this three dimensional graph piece and then assigning like a weight to that graph and then like creating this tree is this is a big topic and this um, cruise call uses like this cruise call formula and it creates this like three dimensional tree in a grasshopper that you can visualize and then this um, mesh graph um, component here to tree, it like unrolls that component down out into the two dimensional plane. Um, and so plugging this, minute. okay. And plugging this into this flat fabrication is where you're going to be able to see the pieces. But the biggest downside to this is that it doesn't just automatically produce an output. So you have to 
output these directly into curves to be able to see each curve that you want to, whether it comes from the cuts, the inside or outside folds, and then the flat lines. Um, and then I also added uh, flaps. So if you were to like take this and cut it, like paper folding, you would have flaps. So this just takes the graph and like knows what lines that you don't need and doesn't just make a ton of flaps and it just assigns flaps to outside edges as necessary. And then you can add like widths and bevels to it. And then this is a piece, this big piece component arrangement cluster. This is from one of his examples, which it was this kind of the flat arrangement fabrication component here just lays them out all on top of each other and it was really difficult to get them to spread out. But um, this piece arrangement allowed me to spread them out and into the, like the size and rows that I wanted and then you have to output them to curves as well. So this is what it looks like after doing that and you could hit, see the pieces and then doing this text tag um, component allows you to see the corresponding unrolled data in three dimensions. So if you were to laser cut this and piece it together in real life, you could like you would know what coordinates and what pieces go where. So um, but yeah, in my video, I go more in depth into each piece and what each component does in Grasshopper. Right. Very quick. Thank you. Yep, this is good. I think this can also be laser cut as plastic. Mm hmm. Good work. Thanks. All right. Let's move on to next person. I believe is uh, Joe. Joe Masker. Okay. Well, if Joe is not available now, I guess we can move on to Maria. Yes, let me pull it up. Okay. Yep, I can see you. Perfect. <clears throat> okay. Can you oh, see yes. my screen? Yes. Okay. okay. So um, I talked about and researched how the use of drones can or how drones can be used in the AEC industry. Um, so uh, a drone is basically refers to an unpiloted aircraft um, or sometimes they're referred to as UAVs, uh, which stands for an unmanned aerial vehicle. So on the right hand side, you can see these are some of the commercial drones that are used today. Um, these get pretty pricey um, and then um, we'll talk a little bit about history. I won't go into all the history of drones, but um, drones have had a long history since about the 1830s, um, which Austrians was were trying to attack Italy and they filled hot air balloons with explosives. So that was like the first um, the first time that we had seen the idea of a drone. So uh, throughout time, drones have typically become, um, something used in war and just recently uh, they have become com commercial there have been commercial drones and um, been being used in the AEC industry and for a plethora of other um, industries and commercial products. Um, so in 2006 was actually like when the first uh, drone license was given out by the FAA um, so in order to fly one of these drones, you do have to have your pilot drone license. Um, basically, you have to study and take a test in order to fly one of these. Um, so to do any of the things that I'm going to talk about, you either have to have your um, drone license to get the information or hire a company to um, get the information that you need to plug into Revit or where, wherever you're trying to plug in the um, content into. So I was actually able to work with um, Brenneman Aerial Services and get some of their like live footage and content um, 
and they kind of helped walk me through like what it would look like out on the site when they go and do a, a survey or a job. Um, so then in 2013, Jeff Bezos from Amazon announced that um, they could potentially see drones being their delivery methods. Um, and you can see on the right hand side here um, that in action. Um, and so that's when drones really started to become popular. Um, and so you can see later in 2015, a thousand drone pilot licenses were uh, passed out. And then in 2016, over 3,000, and it continues to increase every year. So um, some other ways that drones can be used besides the AEC industry, um, we talked a little bit about the delivery methods from Amazon. Um, and grocery stores and things like that have also started to be uh, started to use them. Um, it can also be used for storm tracking and search and rescue. So a lot of police departments will use uh, thermo or thermal drones um, for search and rescue missions um, or even like search and rescue in the mountains um, if they're looking for people. Um, so you can also do 3D mapping of inaccessible terrain. They use them a lot in movies and um, just photographing hard to take images for real estate or advertising. Um, and a new uh, industry that's really been using drones a lot lately is the agricultural inspect for ag agricultural inspections. Um, and so they actually take a thermal drone and it'll they have a software that takes all of the thermal imaging from the drones and actually tells them how healthy their plants are. So um, they tell them if they need more water or less water, if they need um, pesticides, like what they the uh, plants need in order to get the best crop. So that's pretty cool. And people also like to race drones, which is kind of fun. Okay, so now we'll actually talk about how you can use drones in the AEC industry. Um, so we'll go through each one of these a little bit more in depth in the next slides, but you can use them for 3D mapping of construction grounds, um, taking measurements of materials or structures. Um, you can use them to document existing buildings, uh, monitoring and documenting progress of projects. Uh, recognizing and mitigating roof leaks and topography mapping. So 3D mapping of construction grounds. So um, this is on the right hand side, um, some of the images that Brenneman Aerial, Aerial Services um, provided me with um, and helped me walk through. Um, so I used a software called Drone Deploy, which is basically what my tutorial is over and how to take the information that you get from a drone survey in Drone Deploy, how you use it, how you get the information that you need out of it, and then also how you can take the information and plug it into Revit so that you can readily use it. Um, so these images are from Drone Deploy. So essentially the drone goes out, it takes thousands of pictures and compiles them into a single uh, 3D uh, model. And that's what is seen on the right here. So you can really start to see like the divots in the ground for the exca excavations that they've started. Um, so um, you can see like there's mounds of dirt. So you can really get an, an idea of what this site looks like without even going there. Um, so this saves a lot of time and money to architects, construction managers, engineers, um, even to clients be, um, because they're able to now look at their project that's happening without actually having to go to the site and they have a pretty detailed um, image of it. So um, another cool thing that Drone Deploy does, once you have your 3D model input into Drone Deploy, um, you can actually measure um, a volumetric or take a volumetric measurement of any material. Um, so if you can see in this picture on the top, um, I actually took a measurement of how much dirt is here. So um, it tells you over here the area and then the uh, volumetric measurement. 
um, of this dirt so that you know exactly how much you're getting or how much you're selling um, so that you have the exact amount. Um, and then you can also take measurements of just like a distance. So um, if you are trying to put in a door somewhere and you don't know if um, it's going to fit based on some of the changes that you've had to make um, through the addendum or anything like that, you can take a measurement um, that was taken with the drone. Um, so you can see this. It's kind of hard to see, but there's a teal line right here. And um, you can actually take a measurement of that distance. So that distance is like 3.9 feet long, um, which makes sense. That's a uh, palette of CMU. So that's kind of cool that you can do this off-site and offhand. Um, so you can also use these to dot or use drones to document existing buildings. Um, so this is another image from Drone Deploy. Um, so it has already built the model, but this could be really helpful if you are trying to um, input solar panels into or on top of your roof so that you know exactly what is there. Um, even if the drawings have changed a little bit from the uh, initial construction documents, um, you can get a um, idea of um, like what is on the roof right now. So it gives you an accurate representation of what's going on. Um, so you can also monitor and document progress. Um, so Drone Deploy has a software or a system where you can fly the drone in the exact same flight pattern every single time. So you can get the same picture every single time, um, but with the progress. So you can go and click on like November 5th and December 5th and see the exact same image and see the progress that's changed. Um, roof leaks, um, this is actually really cool. So you can use a thermal drone to, um, you take an image using the thermal drone about two hours after the sun sets and it, the water, if you have water sitting on your roof or is leaking in your roof, you can see in this image right here, um, all of these blue blobs with the green around them, that all represents water. Um, so you can start to begin to see um, where your leaks might happen and if you're having issues, um, what might be happening and how you need to mitigate that and uh, catch leaks before they actually happen. And then you can also use topography mapping. So basically takes the topography and um, it creates, you can create a DXF file and input this into Revit and start to um, work your Revit model off of the topography mapping. So that's um, kind of gone over in my, um, my yeah, my video. So that's it. Great. I think it's quite powerful. It's um, able to integrate with a beam modeling process. Yeah, I, was, I had never done that before and it was actually really cool. So, so it's generated a point cloud or you generate a mesh from the drone, uh, the software you use? Um, It's a mesh. Okay. So nice. um, it, it's not as detailed as I, I think it will become a lot more detailed, but it's not as detailed as um, I would want it to be, <laughs> but yeah. I think it, they're headed that direction for sure. Very cool. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, so let's keep going. Uh, let's move on to Maddie. Yep, I'm here. I'll go ahead and start sharing. Go ahead. Oh, that's not right. Yep, I can see our screen. It's the wrong one. <laughs> yeah, I can um, see. see. Okay, can you see it now? Yes. Fantastic. Yeah. 
So I focused on projection mapping, um, placemaking as my concept. So projection mapping is using digital techniques with projectors and screens to create a design on a three-dimensional surface or um, even a flat surface, but it seems to look like it's in a 3D form. Um, the pre-production involves creating a 3D model of a desired object, designing and projecting onto the object to enhance ambiance, um, creating interactive environments and present optical illusions that draw perspective interest. Um, projection mapping uses designated reference planes to define a boundary around a design um, that can either be an image or video, and then project that with light onto an item to alter its appearance. So um, as you can see, kind of with someone Seems behind like on the screen behind. The screen, sorry, uh, is a ladybug scripts. Oh. Are you sure you're sharing the right file? Let's see. You can share our screen one more time. Okay, let me try. Can you see my projection mapping now? No, I'm seeing the solar heat gain PDF, seems like. Mm. You can stop sharing and then share the full screen instead of a program. Okay. Did that work? Mm, still the same. What? Because I clicked stop sharing. Um, Have you stopped sharing? Yes. But for some reason, let me see. Is everybody saw what I see? The ladybug scripts? Yes. Okay. Hmm. It seems like I'm even able to control the slide. That's that's strange. Uh, so let me do this. I will interrupt your share screen, okay? And then I will let you go ahead to take over one more time. All right, so nobody is sharing now. Go ahead to share one more time. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes, yep. Fantastic, okay. Wonderful. So I was talking through, sorry about that. So Go I was ahead. talking through this side, essentially um, with my images kind of showing how you can project on a surface behind someone or onto someone, and then an object itself, um, how a projector can do that into creating a design or um, augmenting what's currently there. So then um, the history of kind of projection mapping um, is also referred to special augmented reality, um, similar to VR and then video mapping. Um, and the first, I mean, we've been, there's been projection for quite a while, but the first documented use of this kind of style was in 1969 um, for the Haunted Mansion ride in, at Disney um, for this like glowing crystal ball. Um, and then it's really just taken off in the last 20 years with increased technological develop, development in um, visual art and live performance. Um, so today it's mainly used for advertising and marketing, art installations um, and enhancing experience for certain events. Um, it really invites human engagement um, and some designs are set to change based on timing, a musical transition or even sensor movement. Um, so kind of from researching and learning this kind of thing, I was very interested in if curated, if projection mapping could start to provide placemaking and or wayfinding into urban areas um, while introducing a design format that could be changed pretty um, often while also um, being very able, able to do it in a very quick iter iterative periods without really um, changing facades and actually having to do a lot of intensive implementation. So um, kind of more information I was looking at and found was that projection types usually are used with projectors, LED screens, or um, the virtual reality lenses. Um, and then there are quite a few software applications that are used to create these mapping techniques. Um, however, for my tutorial, I focused on After Effects for creating my designs. And then some common ones that I did find, however, were Mad Mapper, 
um, Resolume and Millimum. Um, and then kind of some pros and cons of this is it creates a great temporary installation. Um, projectors don't damage existing facades, as I said, and then it provides easy advertising. Um, you can introduce immersive experience at a lower cost. And then um, if you end up using LED screens, you can use them in the daytime for longer periods. Um, that is the one downfall with projection mapping and using projectors is in highlight areas. Um, there's not as much visibility in like the daylight. So you're kind of limited to a nighttime um, and the reduced, time, reduced times of when traffic is kind of able to see these kinds of things. So then I'm um, just looking at the design process as selecting a site, measuring and lighting assessment, um, a workflow layout, designing creation, modeling process, um, projector testing, installation, and then you kind of get your final result. So the site that I actually looked at was the front of the blue box at, here at University of Cincinnati um, on the south entrance. Um, I was just really interested on these two walls just because it's a really big entrance that a lot of people enter into and were these nice flat facades to kind of work through. Um, so then for one, I picked three designs that I really wanted to look at. They were very different in their styles, um, in their dimensions and kind of scale and illusion that they were gonna create. Um, so the first one was actually looking at Cincinnati's terminal, the um, underground terminal here in Cincinnati. Um, I was looking at just a field landscape that is kind of just an open scape. And then also developing again to that wayfinding um, element of like how to develop a DAP sign and essentially like augment that you're in the space of DAP and where you're located on within the front of the building. Um, so with Adobe After Effects, it's pretty standard video editing. Um, it provides a very similar workflow to um, all their Adobe programs like Illustrator and Photoshop. Um, to begin, I created the composition boards to house the set of layers for dimensions. Um, and then for the teaching purpose and kind of like Figuring out this design, um, I actually have the building itself in a dark, like late at night kind of view, so you can actually see what the projection would actually look like. Um, so creating the surfaces on it and the existing facade, you mainly use um, corner pin and masking commands to actually create the depth and dimensions of like the openings when you're projecting onto the site. So then um, kind of importing my designs and the colors and those um, images into the design. Um, and kind of framing them and selecting kind of how those would look over a period of time um, using pen tool to kind of subtract those openings and create things and um, define with the polygons. And then um, using this tool also allows you to change the angles of certain elements. Um, and then I also played with the camera aspect so that it seems like you're zooming in and kind of like as you walk up on the site, it seems like you're zooming in and actually going through the tunnel itself with my one design. So with that, I also added music for context and um, kind of these transitional moments between the designs, um, kind of the fading as well. So things don't seem so abrupt and unnatural and you kind of see these elements and they become these natural parts of the actual building. Um, and then after you're done element um, affecting and creating your design, you actually just do a final render in the queue and then you um, are able to click render and it processes it and turn, kind of smooths out all those transitions. So then my final projection, um, it kind of provides a deeper understanding of an idea connecting to the space. And then I also applied music um, as well to kind of focus on the embodied user and then kind of see what these kinds of concepts would mean, could mean for projection mapping in the future. So these were the three essentially like last images. Um, here's two other images of the, that wayfinding design, whether that's a giant map on the ground, um, on the side of a building, just very interesting. And then I can also, I was going to share my video as well, at least the ending of um, that final image here. So. Is the video playing? Oh yeah, it's playing. Oh, can you see the video playing? Yes, yeah. It's a little bit delayed lagging, but I can see it's okay. changing the color to red. That's good. Yes. Mm -hmm. Very nice. So this is a post production in Adobe. Uh, after effects, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Nice. Um, I guess you can actually 
um, get the same effects when you have like set up the project or in the evening. Yes, yeah, to, um, it was yeah. definitely very cool and um, definitely mm -hmm. very worthwhile experience. And After Effects is very interesting. It was a lot more user friendly. Like I said, it's very similar to other Adobe products, um, yeah. which made it very nice in terms of overlapping, understanding concepts and mm -hmm. working within for sure. Um, but definitely, I think it's a very interesting way of potentially furthering the idea of wayfinding and placemaking, um, especially with the last image of the grass and stuff like that. I felt like seeing that landscape in person too was just very like surreal almost too as well. Mm -hmm. All right. Cool. Thank you Thank so you. much. All right. Um, so let's move on to next person. Um, Ju. Yep. Um, here, I'll just start the screen share. Uh, let's see. Uh, there we go. Um, yes. Yep. I see. Right. Um, so yeah, the research topic that I covered um, was, uh, you know, a demo over Fusion 360. Um, and so uh, just the presentation is going to be, you know, a brief overview of introducing Fusion 360, and then obviously the full presentation covers the in-depth demo of the program. So, um, you know, I'm going to tell you guys about uh, what Fusion 360 is, what it can do, and then why it's relevant, and then I'll leave a link to the actual demo. Um, so what it is, it's obviously it's a 3D modeling software, um, but it uses cloud-based computing. Um, and it's really uh, centered around designing like products and components, elements and assemblies. Um, and so it's really meant for designing the, the parts rather than the whole. And so uh, it, it doesn't cover projects as large as maybe, you know, Rhino or Twin Motion or something like that. It's a lot more geared towards designing the actual individual components that would populate those projects. Um, and then, yeah, obviously it's a part of uh, the Autodesk collection. Um, and so because of that, it's great because it's um, free through the educational packages, which we get through UC. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so it's, it's about the design, testing, and manufacturing of all those products. So uh, what can it do? Um, so first of all, there's parametric design. Um, it uses a lot of um, user-defined parameters. Um, I think it's a little more straightforward than Grasshopper, um, you know, because most of your your parameters you type in and then you you write a a formula or a uh, you know a defined measurement or whatever for it. Um, and then uh, it it has a generative design feature, which um, you know we've heard other presentations on what that is and you know, how it can save uh, material and, you know, it's just a, a whole new unique uh, design tool. Um, and then uh, again, because it's, you know, focused on designing these smaller pieces, you know, um, there's assemblies and joints. Um, you can you can really kind of piece together like how things would uh, function with each other. So, you know, I've got uh, this little like reel so you could um, in the program you can animate how you know these pieces might revolve around each other or slide past each other um, and interact. Um, and then you know, as an extension of that, you can do animations and motion captures to really see how your your products actually uh, function. Um, and then uh, again, it's a cloud-based uh, software, so all the rendering that you want to do. So this render would have been done through uh, uh, cloud. Um, computing. So you would send it to uh, Fusion 360's cloud. It would render it there while you could keep working on your project totally, you know, unhindered because it's not working off of your machine's power, which is really great, um, you know, because there are, you know, in Rhino or, you know, Lumion, I think there's some of those programs that you can render, but it's using your machine's power. So maybe you can keep working, but it's you're splitting up the processing power of your computer, whereas cloud-based stuff is really great because you can totally keep working. Um, and then same thing with analysis. It does cloud analysis. 
Um, so you can do like structural analysis of, of how a load might interact with your, um, you know, your uh, geometries and, and volumes. Um, and then another really interesting uh, uh, feature of Fusion 360 is manufacturing simulation, which can be really, really, really helpful because um, I've heard them called tool paths, but essentially what you're doing is you are simulating how a 3D printer or a CNC or anything that's a, a digitally based um, manufacturing, you can simulate how that might actually create your model or your, um, you know, whatever you're trying, whatever you want to make, you can simulate it before you actually try and physically produce it. Um, and I think you can even edit how the machine might actually, um, you know, its tool path. Um, so uh, why is this actually relevant to architects? Um, you know, especially because it seems more geared towards product designers and, um, you know, industrial design. So um, I think it's really great because uh, it's a it's a platform that helps designers really zoom in to the smaller components. So in an architecture um, setting, you know, I've used this for designing, uh, you know, windows and, um, you know, but there's a lot of other small elements that go into an architectural project like furniture, um, you know, doors, um, you know, anything you want custom, even down all the way down to a, a door handle. And, and maybe you want to see how uh, that might actually function and you can design that customly at a much more zoomed in scale. Um, and then two, you know, obviously, you know, we've seen the power of generative and parametric design, um, you know, and, and then cloud based computing and how much that can increase the speed and ease of your production. That's always helpful to our architects. It doesn't really matter what design field you're in. Speeding up your process is always great. Um, and then, uh, you know, the analysis and simulation um, is, is really great, I think, for architects because it can really help you to refine your process um, and, and test out your manufacturing virtually before you're wasting materials and time, you know, instead of sitting in front of a CNC for you know, four hours and then realizing it messed up your project, you can test that out virtually and then, you know, basically fast forward or, you know, play it, you know, 10 times the speed and see how the CNC is working before you, you know, screw up. Um, and then lastly, um, Fusion 360 um, is really, really helpful because it is an Autodesk program. It's great because it can uh, be used in conjunction with other software, especially other Autodesk products. Um, and so th I think this is especially helpful for uh, architects because um, so Fusion 360, you know, with its parametric stuff, it's, it's really centered around user defined parameters. And um, when you do that, if you if you guys have ever used Revit um, and you've tried to look for a door or you know a window or whatever you're plugging into into Revit, there is you know families. There's like you know several presets, and you can go through and select. Oh, I want a 36 inch door as opposed to a 32 inch door, you know, and you can run down the line of different dimensions. Well, that's typically powered by Fusion 360, where someone has used Fusion 360 to develop a parametric model of something smaller that can then be imported into Revit as a family. Um, so I have one want, minute. Okay, yeah. Um, and so um, I think that's really, really powerful just because it's, um, you know, if Revit only has a certain number of presets in there and they're much more generic than is probably desired for most architects. So um, I think it's really great because then you can go in and you can make all your custom components and then you can import them into Revit. Um, and then that's basically the presentation. Um, you know, I just kind of gave you the brief, you know, overview. And then in the demo, I really kind of flesh out what does it look like to make a, ge a generic component with the parametric design and show off kind of the power of how, um, you know, how effective and efficient that can be. All right. Thank you, Joe.
I think this is good. I look forward to watch the full video. Going over um, how Ladybug plugin works with Grasshopper and also kind of explaining um, how generative design informs performance based design. Ladybug is kind of a plugin that looks and analyzes a lot of the performance of how a building works. Um, this kind of just goes through what I'm going to be covering. So we got performance based design, um, firms that utilize this workflow. What are Ladybug's capabilities? Why this is relevant to architects? And then just showing some more projects that have benefited from this analysis project. Uh, so architecture plays a very pivotal role in society and has always been driven by humans, requirements, but also arts. Um, I compare the, these relationships to um, generative design and performance design. Generative design is like modern architecture's expression and more of the artistic nature, while the performance-based design features more practical analysis of the built environments and how things like shelter, security, and privacy um, work on a more practical level. Today, architecture does more than just satisfy our basic human needs, but it enhances our lives through moderni modernity, technology, health, and it helps connect us to other people. And I feel like Ladybug is one of these kind of pioneered softwares that helps architects quickly and, and efficiently analyze these designs with objective factors. So it helps, Ladybug helps analyze sun patterns, winds, how heating, ventilation, and air conditioning works. It could also use um, approaches to kind of limit the material used, which in turn helps out the budgets. Um, so just kind of going over performance-based design. Um, this, pro this, this approach is kind of a complex system that is based on the environments and also the functionality of the project. This could be on a bunch of different types of programs. Um, it could be on a residential home, commercial building, really any type of variety of project. Um, a building with this method is set to meet specific performance requirements such as energy efficiency, structural loads, and of a ton of other things. Um, this is in direct contrast to the traditional practices. Um, Performance-based design allows an architect or designer a lot of freedom to develop the tools and evaluate and analyze their building. So it takes a building and it shoots out a lot of ideas through generative design, and then you can choose which approach to go with based on things like sun patterns and winds and things like that instead of just picking one because it simply looks cooler than another project um, and then these are some projects that are generative design and then also performance-based design so we can see how generative design makes these really cool forms um, on the left with the hadid and the stem stem hughes stores um, but you can also see in the right that we've got um, some really innovative, cool firms such as Foster and Partners and then Dort Mundred. Um, with these approaches, you have like these triple height spaces you can see with Foster and Partners and the Comcast Technology Center. They have this triple height space that features a lot of glass. So they wanted to study the reflectivity of that space. So you can see it helps create these purple and orange and kind of blue graphs. So Ladybug really helps. It creates your graphs and your drawings as well as tests your design ideas. So it kind of creates everything all in one nice package in a very cohesive, easy to read way. Um, and then down here with the Dort Moondred, the Whale Research Center. Um, this is a project in Norway that was basically designed through generative design, but then it was this form is also generated to highlight the culture, but also um, overall wind loads. So it featured kind of a performance based design approach with that as well. Um, and then to just go over the capabilities and what is Ladybug. So Ladybug takes, um, or how Ladybug works. You will import a weather file known as an EPW um, from anywhere in the world. So you can use a site in Cincinnati or um, in my demo video, I used a site in Shanghai. Um, and then you plug that into either Grasshopper or Dynamo. And then this information will create either a 2D 
drawing, a 3D graph or chart or another type of interactive display to illustrate what you can see on the right, whether that's sun patterns or solar panel analysis or viewport analysis, how it interacts with the human body, um, shade benefits, and also energy renewal or renewable energy. Um, so a lot of capabilities here um, and all based on performance. Um, so this is going over more why should designers use Ladybug? Um, the improved efficiency of the design process. So as I covered a little earlier, it creates your graphics kind of for you, um, but also test your current design ideas. So you can see if you want to get you know light into a specific space, you can test that right then and there if it really happens. Um, also produces performance back design decisions. So you can use generative design in Grasshopper and then feed this geometry into Ladybug and choose based on performance, which one you want to go with. Um, another really strong capability is Ladybug is a part of a kind of team tool software. Um, it also features Honeybee, Butterfly and Dragonfly. Um, all are performance-based design software, and they all kind of do different things. I think Butterfly does more like wind studies um, and things such as that. And then I just found a quote that I thought really illustrated kind of what Ladybug and this process really does. So building simulation tools have gained popularity in their area, given their ability to accelerate the design process, enhance efficiency, and enable different designs to be compared, leading to more optimal solutions while also allowing a better understanding of the results of design decisions. So I think that that kind of illustrates my point of this workflow of Rhino to Grasshopper and then to Ladybug to really get the most optimal result for the clients. Um, and then these are some more projects that have benefited from performance-based design. So we've got kind of a twisted tower look um this was kind of an urban farm apartment building um ladybug was used to kind of manipulate the form of this twisting but also figure out the best placement for these um, farming spaces and like greenhouse and uh, gardens on the balconies another project it did is on the bottom right um, with mass timber projects Ladybug's also really good about analyzing um, structural loads and um, sun patterns. So this project also really benefited from that. And then we got more of my scripting and demonstration. So my demonstration kind of goes over how to script um, a Ladybug script to specifically how to test specific geometries based on their context. So you can see on the bottom right, I tested this massing model in a Shanghai site um, with the past studio project that I did. Um, and we figured out kind of the best face to do this really complex system, which is in the top right where we had this system of solar panels that rotated. So we used Ladybug to generate um, which side of the building would, would be most beneficial to put this facade on. And then we also use the script to generate what angle um, to rotate these solar panels at different times of the day to, to um, maximize the energy gain of this system. So, and the demo goes more over how to kind of actually script that and bake the geometries and get more into that uh, realm of everything. And then here's just kind of links and everything citing All my right. sources. Good. So you have the full video to uh, demonstrate step right. by step process. Great. Well, look forward to reading. Thank you.